Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and I am joined today by a German historian, uh, David X. Noack, who wrote his PhD dissertation about the second tournament of shadows in Central Asia, which is a topic that we actually talked about uh, already on this channel a couple of uh, months ago. I'll put a link to that video in here. Um, but today we are here to discuss uh, uh, Moldova and um, m more specifically Transnistria, which is the kind of separatist region of uh, Moldova, because David is also a great expert about Eastern Europe. He has been, he speaks uh, Russian, he reads Russian, and he has been uh, observing um, several former um, Soviet states and, and how they are how they are doing today. And he's is particularly well versed about the political processes in Transnistria. So um, David, it's very nice to have you back on the channel. Hello. So David, maybe can I start by asking you um, to lay out a bit the the history of Moldova and Transnistria and why these two um, entities which are joined together at the moment don't get along with each other. Yes, in the early 1990s, the Moldovan Socialist Soviet Republic, so part of the Soviet Union, split into two parts. Well, in reality, into three parts, but I'm going to talk about two only. Um, the, in Chisinau, the, the capital, a new political elite rose to power and they wanted a clean break with Moscow. They wanted to split away from the Soviet Union and some of them even joining Romania. So a total changing of borders. And in Tiraspol, the old guard, the established elites of the old Socialist Republic, they established a Transnistrian Republic first within the Soviet Union, which was not recognized by Moscow, but later um, as a so-called independent state which is not recognized by any United Nations member state. So it was a political conflict, never an ethnic conflict. In Transnistria, about one third of the population is Rome, Moldovan, one third is Ukrainian, one third is Russian, but they all speak Russian as a lingua franca. So um, they are mostly Russianized, um, but um, it's, a, it's a multicultural society. And around 100,000 of the Currently, 400,000 inhabitants in Transnistria um, have their Ukrainian passport. And it, it's estimated that about the same have the Moldovan and the Russian passports. Some even have several passports in order to travel either to the east or to the west. Um, and yeah, so they split apart. There was a short war uh, about 30 years ago, which was ended by the Russian army, which was still in in Transnistria stationed and there is a trilateral peacekeeping force um, which observes the yeah, the armistice because there has never been a peace treaty or, or polit political solution. And since then, the two republics, so Moldova and Transnistria, they yeah, develop in different directions. In Transnistria, we had a continuation of the Soviet system, even in political terms, um, many organs still have the same name like the supreme soviet is uh, the parliament and um so in, in it looks like a soviet system but it's a russian capitalist system in transnistria and in moldova we had the turn to the international monetary fund and to the west and getting closer to the european union and even to nato and um yeah it's a totally different political system but since 1994 um, moldova is officially neutral um, and Transnistria, as part of a political solution that was discussed 20 years ago and, and 10 years ago, um, always insisted on the Moldovan neutrality if Transnistria would rejoin the Moldovan Republic or rejoin Moldova as it is uh, today. But in the current war, um, it's, it's even more complicated than yeah, the 30 year history might um, might. Um, you might think about yeah because the uh, there was a time like before 2022 when moldova and transnistria at least kind of got along right although i, I saw a, a very nice uh, documentary where you also were were there and you could see how i mean there's border controls right although transnistria officially belongs to moldova there's border controls and and there's you 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 got to show your passport to get get in and out 
and um, th the, these two entities got along somewhat with each other. Um, but that was only after like the 2000s, right? Yeah, in the 1990s, it was quite difficult because in, in Moldova, they still had the Soviet currency and they somehow yeah, pretended like the Soviet Union still exists, even though it didn't. But uh, it was a highly Sovietized system. While in, in Moldova in the 1990s, we had shock therapy, we had a sharp downturn in economic terms and many unemployed people, and it was mostly isolated. But in the, twin, in the early 2000s, the Communist Party gained power in, in Moldova. Um, Vladimir Voronin was the president, and he stabilized the political and the socio-economic system. And there was the idea in the Cossack memorandum to yeah, establish a federation between um, Moldova and Transnistria, or a, a new, a newborn state, or a new state uh, together. And the the trade also, um, yeah, was expanded. And that solution did not turn out well. And twenty years ago, ten years ago, there was the Mezebek memorandum, which was kind of a second attempt to, um, yeah, to enforce that federation. But that um, wasn't accepted by outside powers like the United States and Romania and Great Britain. And in the last decade or so, there was the German strategy via the OSCE um, to make small steps like um, open bridges and recognize um, number plates on cars and also university um, degrees. And yeah, so they were getting along. They were getting along quite well. Um, but there were many, there were also some problems like uh, in Transnistria, the Moldovan language is written in Cyrillic script and they don't recognize Romanian, which is written in Latin script as, yeah, as an equal language. But the Moldovan go government insisted that there are also schools in the Moldovan language or in the Romanian language with a, with a Latin script. And there were always some tensions and in late 2021, the Transnistrian army um, held some military exercises and they were attempting to cross rivers. And the fear in Moldova was, well, maybe they're trying to, yeah, yeah, to exercise what would happen if they would conquer Moldova. But then in early 2022, um, yeah, many people realized, well, they were not attempting to go west, the Transnistrian army, but they were trying to, what would happen if they had to go east, so in, in the Ukrainian direction. So, and when we now talk about the, the whole situation with Ukraine, uh, Western media often just very simplistically says, oh, Russian troops are occupying parts of Moldova. They are in Transnistria. There is already an occupation force. You know, the Russians are already kind of uh, branching even out. Is there anything to that? What, what do you respond to this framing? Well, in the early 1990s, the Russian army intervened, which was, yeah, kind of the rest of the Soviet troops that were stationed there. But even back then, um, General Lebet, who was kind of a quite prominent uh, figure in 1990s Russian politics, who was called the, the Russian Napoleon, um, he even admitted that most of his troops were Transnistrians. They were, they were born there, they were raised Russian, and then they joined the Soviet and then later the Russian army. Um, and yeah, then they joined the fight against the Moldovans when there was this short civil war. And even today, there is a um, there are two separate Russian troops, or yeah, yeah two or three, uh, however you count it. There is this trilateral peacekeeping force of Transnistrian, Moldovan, and Russian soldiers. And then there is a an, another Russian troop, the operational group of Russian forces, and they mostly guard an ammunition depot which is um, very old and many weapons that the Soviets withdrew from the Czechoslovakia and Eastern Germany uh, that was um, concentrated there. And it's kind of rotting there since now 30 years. Uh, and this um, operational group of uh, Russian forces and even the, the peacekeeping contribution of the Russians, um, that's about 1,500 Russian soldiers, but of them it's mostly um, 100 to 200 Russian officers, real Russian officers, and the rest are Transnistrians who, yeah, who get the Russian uniforms and paid in Russian ruble, not in Transnistrian rubles. Um, and it's mostly a local force, but um, it's part of the Russian army. And in 2014, after the Crimean crisis, 
um, the the Ukrainian side cut off the um, the yeah the logistics or the 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 support lines of those Russian troops because until then the Russians sent their ships to Odessa and then they went to Transnistria in order to get the weapons there or new ammunition and then the the Ukrainians stopped that but the Russian troops are still there and it's mostly well they are old and they are the old Soviet factories and they are yeah getting their support from within Transnistria and there are not many Russians there they have Russian uniforms and a part of the Russian army but they are mostly Transnistrians in Russian uniforms um, there and today because of the Ukrainian Russo-Ukrainian war many people draw parallels like well it's occupied by Russia and we just need to get rid of the Russian troops there but if you um, deal with the conflict and do research about it you um, you realize well it's it's a Transnist it's a Transnistrian force it's there's Transnistrian politics they are closely entangled with Russia. They rely on R Russian energy exports, and that they don't have to pay them, and also on um, yeah on subsidies and uh, support for for the pensions and also things like this R Russian soldiers um, there. But it's mostly a local issue, and they also have close relations with the Ukrainians, or they had until recently, and also have close relations with. Uh, with Moldova and it's more a local issue and a 30 year long political conflict within the former Moldovan Socialist Republic or within the today internationally recognized borders of Moldova and Russia is, is a player there is important and had to be involved if there would be a peaceful solution but it's not like the local actors don't have any agency and don't have their own interests and their own goals and they're also Local companies like the Sheriff Company, which is renowned because of uh, Sheriff Tiraspol, the, the football club who also played against Real Madrid and, and uh, other international players. Um, so there are there are local actors with own, with their own agency, and that has to be uh, yeah taken into consideration if you want to talk about the Transnistrian conflict uh, in a differentiated matter. So. Um it's pretty certain that there are more NATO peacekeeping forces in Kosovo than there are Russian peacekeeping forces in uh, in Transnistria. Is is this comparable or not? Well, in K four in Kosovo, I think that's more than so, uh, that's several thousand soldiers. Yes, but right. uh, in in Transnistria, yeah, it's about one thousand five hundred uh, Russian soldiers, and Transnistria has its own army, which is also part of the trilateral peacekeeping force. They have their ah. joint control commission, yeah. it is called, and they so, have um, patrols. They patrol the territory together with Russian and Moldovan soldiers. Um, it's it's not really comparable because the Kosovo security force in Kosovo. Well, they are just established and they are establishing their own military, which uh, is going to be founded, I think, at the end of the decade. Um, but from the sheer number of troops, I think there are more NATO troops in Kosovo than there are Russian troops in, in Transnistria. And why also Russia never recognized Transnistria as an own state, right? Nobody, none of the former Soviet republics recognizes Transnistria as its own state. Um, so there is nobody at this moment has any plans except for a couple of political forces inside Transnistria to make Transnistria an independent state, right? Yes, Russia did not recognize it. In 2008, when they recognized Abkhazia and South Ossetia, there was kind of the discussion, well, they might also recognize um, Transnistria, um, but that would have complicated things further. And under Medvedev back then, um, the Russian, uh, the Polish Center for Eastern Studies, which is a think tank in, in Warsaw, and they um, wrote that the Russian strategy is more like a Taiwanization of Transnistria. So there is a state, it's not officially recognized. Russia has a consulate there and they have cultural and economic and military relations, but they do not want to recognize it because of Moldova, um, the Russian strategy for, yeah, now two decades was that Transnistria would rejoin or join Moldova and build a new state. And then this new state would be neutral, which would suit Russian interests in the region. Um, and that's why they didn't recognize the independence. So because in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, um, the recognition ended the conflict or froze the conflict for 
one and a half decades now, mm -hmm. but political solutions between Georgia or the Georgian central government and the separatist governments in Abkhazia and in South Ossetia are nearly impossible because um, the, the separatist republics say, well, we are independent, we are recognized by Russia and also some other states. Um, and the Georgians say, well, it's Russian occupied and we do not talk to them. Um, but it froze the conflict. It ended the military conflict, but the political conflict still persists. And in Transnistria, uh, it always had a different dimension because the, the economies of Transnistria and Moldova were always closely entangled. The Transnistrian oligarchs are considered to be more powerful than the Moldovan oligarchs. And they also have some interests in Ukraine and in Moldova. Um, and it's kind of a different factor and it profits from this Taiwan situation so that it's a state more or less, but uh, not recognized because uh, in, from Ukraine, they could import um, yeah, products without customs and then they could export them. So the smuggling was a, always a big factor because they could import things via Ukraine and then export it back again and then never have to pay customs there. And they export in the West when they write made in Moldova on the products, but you can buy uh, Transnistrian goods. And there are also many German companies like Aldi, the, 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 um, the, the chain of supermarkets. They buy um, products in Transnistria, even Italian, um, um, Italian producers or producers, uh, labels uh, who sell yeah, high cost products, they produce them in Transnistria, then get them to, to Italy and then sell them uh, with a high, <laughs> high profit rate <laughs> on the Italian market. So it's um, the, the, the political groups in Transnistria always profited from this situation. There was an independence referendum in 2006, but that was mostly to, yeah, to gain the, uh, to, to mobilize their own electorate for the then current, for the then president. Um, but it was never a real strategy of Transnistria to be recognized internationally. And you can see that by the um, Foreign Ministry of Abkhazia, they always send diplomatic notes to states like Italy, Germany, France, Spain, and they also have um, unofficial representatives in the United States and in New Zealand, but Transnistria doesn't do anything like that. They have their informal relations with um, with Russia, with a bureau in Moscow, and they um, yeah negotiate in the within the USCE with Moldova, and also have their informal relations with Kiev, um, but they never yeah try to gain international recognition. They are recognized by Abkhazia and South Ossetia. There are some yeah mostly symbolic relations, um, but um, there is no strategy of Transnistria to be uh, internationally recognized as an independent state because they profit from the situation as it is now. So your or interpretation, war war? your interpretation of the situation is that the uh, Transnistrians themselves are not unhappy with the current status quo, even though you can't really call it a solution, but it is for them at least a stable situation. Well, now means before the war, um, but well, yeah, it was it was a stable situation. They traded with the east, with the west. Um, Transnistria even joined the deep um, trade agreement that Moldova had signed with the EU, the so-called mm. um, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, um, because Transnistria ex exports more than 50% go to the EU. So they are interested in um, having those economic relations even though they are not recognized and they have to say, well, we are Moldova if they want to export to, to the West. Um, but yeah, I think they were quite happy um, and they were economically thriving. The pensions and the, the wages are higher than in Moldova because um, they are not internationally recognized. They don't have to take uh, grants or credits from the International Monetary Fund to do their reforms. They do that indirectly through the EU, or not credit and grants, but the EU has some measures they wanted to introduce in Transnistria, like, a, um, oh, how, how's it called in English? But uh, like some taxes had to be introduced, um, but mostly they're independent. They have their debts in Russia, and Russia, if they would rejoin Moldova, then those debts uh, would be Moldovan debts in Russia. So Russia also has an interest not to 
solve it immediately because if there is a political solution uh, uh, yeah solution that ends the conflict the the former military conflict um then russia would have uh, would have greater leverage on moldova um but yeah until now it's this taiwan situation in a small in a small capacity and the transistron yeah kind of live with that Oh, that's that's very interesting. So how um, how did then the war in Ukraine? I mean, um, February twenty twenty two. How did that change this equation for the Transnistrians and for Moldova? Yeah, I, I talked about those maneuvers or those military exercises, and they're kind of unsettling because there was never a military escalation in the last thirty years between. Transnistria and Moldova, there is this trilateral peacekeeping force and there had never been a, group, a bigger incident like on the Abkhaz-Georgian border in, in the 1990s or early 2000s. And then the Russians invaded Ukraine and they didn't know how fast they would yeah, conquer Kiev and also Odessa because if they would have conquered Odessa, then it would have been sure they would be very close to Transnistria and in the first weeks or in the first days of the war, there were some voices that's, that expected, well, the, ninth, the 7th of May parade, also the victory parade in May, um, that uh, the, the 9th of May parade, uh, um, that the, the Russians always celebrate, that could be celebrated in Tiraspol and Transnistria as well, if they would have been very fast, but they hadn't been. Um, and they failed in Kiev, they failed in the, in the east, they are mostly in Zaporizhia and um, and in the Donbas and Transnistria um, kept its neutrality. It, neutrality never was an issue for Transnistria because um, it's not internationally recognized. They consider themselves part of the Russian world. They even have the Russian flag as their co-official flag. Um, but then the war started and Transnistria is highly dependent on Ukraine because Odessa is the port that the Transnistrian um, yeah, companies used for their exports, so they were um, heavily reliant on Ukraine and granting their exports and imports. But in yeah, in late February, early March, the Ukraine the Ukrainians closed the border. The Transnistrian government said, "Well, uh, it's kind of a blockade, but still um, through Moldova, the Transnistrians can export things, and there are also some uh, thirty thousand refugees went from Ukraine to Transnistria. But because the border was closed, they first had to go to Moldova, and then they uh, could go to Transnistria. But the Transnistrian government always spoke of the situation in Ukraine or the um, events in Ukraine, but they never talked either of war, as the Ukrainians do and we in the West do. But they also never talked about the special military operation, like it's the Russian propaganda line. There was um, a demonstration in Tiraspol in order to support the war, but fewer than 100 people showed up and there is no official line supporting the Russian invasion. Um, and the Transnistrians, who had never to deal with neutrality until then, um, yeah, they're kind of in a situation now where they have to rely on their neutrality in order not to get yeah attacked by the ukrainians or get further problems with the moldovans and so did that is that working out for transnistria are they now still able to access the world or the rest uh, uh, of of the world through moldova or did moldova close as well and maybe can you talk about how moldova took its neutrality and how that one is developing as well since we now have basically two kind of neutrals more or less inside the same official borders yeah moldova is neutral since more or less 30 years now and they insisted on their neutrality when the war began they had to um oh, many ukrainian refugees settled in moldova and depend uh, when you look at the numbers of how many inhabitants the country has Moldova I think has the most um, uh, the most refugees per capita in Europe and they um, still insist on their or yeah still insist more or less on their neutrality there were some voices in the last weeks that Moldova might abandon that neutrality and uh, in order to join NATO that's a discussion the the Moldovan president started Maya Sandu 
she's a liberal, she worked for the World Bank and was supported by the um, the Merkel party during her presidential campaign. So she's a liberal conservative, close to Western institutions, also to NATO. That would be a hard turn in, in Moldovan politics because that was nearly never discussed in the last 30 years. There were the the, the liberals, the liberal party, it's called, well, it's called the liberal party, but it's the right wing party in, of Moldova. They always wanted to join Romania in order to get a greater uh, Romania. And that was kind of the, the easy way in order to join NATO and the EU. But um, they never had more than 10% uh, in the Moldovan political sphere. And they are currently not in parliament. So that's not a, it's not a political current that has, um, that is very strong in Moldova. But the liberal conservative government now, they talk about, well, maybe we could abandon neutrality in order to join, in order to join a, a pact or a military alliance. But um, because of the war and because they are suffering economically um, from the influx either or for, from the fallout of, of the Ukrainian war, of the Russo-Ukrainian war, they have many problems domestically and there are um, large scale demonstrations of the opposition and they would be in favor of joining the Eurasian Economic Union, so turn turn east again. So it's it's always a kind of struggle, but the, so far neutrality stands. Moldova is neutral and wants to remain neutral. And Transnistria, it's even struggling, struggling more from, um, from the Russo-Ukrainian war because they were dependent on either Ukraine and Russia. And uh, there were estimates that the the GDP of Transnistria fell by 20% in the last year, so it's, it's struck very, very hard. But they can still export via Moldova. And there were even discussions, because Moldova has a Danube port far in the south, close to well, in a Romanian-Moldovan-Ukrainian triangle. There is a, a Moldovan Danube port, and um, the Transnistrians um, were negotiating with the Moldovans that they could use that port in order to export to Italy. <laughs> Um, but via trucks, they can always go west and um, export to to the European Union. That's no problem. But Odessa is closed because the border is closed to the east, and there are always some tensions. And um, Alexander Arestovich, who was an advisor to Zelensky, he proposed in April last year for the first time that the Ukrainians might take Transnistria in order to solve that conflict. And there were some rumors like this again in the last weeks. Um, but that will be a disaster because Moldova is not directly involved in the war. They are neutral. There were some border infringements by the Russians because they shot cruise missiles via Moldova into Ukraine. And the Ukrainians always protested about that. That's the, uh, totally correct. And that's the right. And they are neutral. So there are no um, arms um, exports via Moldova to Ukraine that we know of. They are mostly exported via Poland. Um, so, so far, neutrality stands and both sides are more or less neutral. One is closer to Russia, one is closer to the West. But so far, uh, yeah, neutrality persists. And I hope that it will persist um, after the war, or whenever the war ends. But that will still um, yeah, continue to exist in Moldova in the following and, years, in the next years. And help me with this one. I mean, Moldova has a neutrality clause in its constitution, right? So if it wanted to join NATO or something, it would actually have to go through a constitutional change, with which, which will probably require a public referendum. Uh, Transnistria, do they have any kind of legal uh, um, lock in their uh, constitution to make sure that they can join an, another force? Oh never dealt with the Transnistrian constitution so far. There is an official policy that Transnistria wants to join the Eurasian Economic Union um, that was discussed after uh, after yeah, Belarus, Kazakhstan and Russia established that union. But yeah, that's highly unrealistic and it does not border to any Eurasian Economic um, Union member. Um, but I don't know if there is any part in the Transnistrian constitution that would uh, prohibit joining a military alliance or something like that and because it's not internationally recognized that's kind of a theoretical question more not, not a practical okay. one but in moldova yeah. the constitution had to be or would have to be changed 
So um, at the moment, the, uh, the there are very strong internal um, incentives for Moldova also and for Transnistria to to keep this neutrality in order not to worsen also their own political and economic situations. It's not just the power game between the, the other states around them. Uh, but there is, you're saying there yeah, well, is a threat that the, you, that there might be an attack uh, fr- coming from Ukraine because Ukraine might actually use this uh, this Russian soldiers on Transnistrian soil as a reason to say like this is this is enemy territory. Yeah, that was discuss, uh, discussed by Arrestovich. He was fired 10 d- days ago as an advisor, but there were some voices in the Ukrainian political sphere who proposed that. Um, um, and in, when Transnistria was established in the early 1990s, it had support by Ukraine because the Ukrainian government did not want to yeah, get, uh, get rid of the economic interaction with um, with Transnistria and in the early 2000s there were also some very powerful Ukrainian oligarchs invested in Transnistria so the the large steel plant uh, steel plant in Ribnitsa was partly owned by Ukrainian oligarchs and for two decades um, Transnistria could always rely on Ukraine then in 2014 the political climate in Ukraine changed and also yeah the relations with um, Transnistria deteriorate, d- deteriorated but they never tried anything in order to attack them. They, there were always some political proposals by the Moldovan government that the, the trilateral peacekeeping force, with including the Russians, could be replaced by an OSCE um, peacekeeping force. But the Transnistria and the Russians never agreed to that. But now, because there are 1,500 more or less Russian soldiers in Transnistria, it's kind of a threat for uh, the, Ukra- the Ukrainians. They also um, bombed the, oh, they, um, they put an end to the bridges between uh, Transnistria and Ukraine, closed the border, closed the railway line, um, because they feared that the Russians or the Transnistrians in Russia or the Russians in Transnistria might come through uh, through those border checkpoints in order to yeah to to attack Odessa. Um, which has never happened, and the Transnistrian government denies that there is a possibility. Um, but for the Ukrainians, it's always yeah, a military um, factor because the Russians could attack from the north, from Belarus at any time. They could attack from the south, from Transnistria, but most of the heavy fighting is in the east and in the Donbas. But for for the government in Kiev, yeah, the, the Transnistrian issue is kind of yeah an, an enigma they don't know how, what how to deal with that they have no political solution they could continue like they did in the last three decades but from a military standpoint yeah it's 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 not clear how the russians would react and in late april and early may there were some explosions within or some bomb attacks within transnistria the the state security ministry was attacked um but it was a public holiday so nobody was harmed and also the airport in Tiraspol, which is not in use for or haven't been used in the last 30 years. Um, there were some bomb attacks. There were also bomb threats on the university in Tiraspol. And it looked like some political players within Transnistria might uh, be interested in joining the war because there were some provocations and now they could, they would have a reason in order to, to attack the Ukrainians. Um, but nothing grew out of it. So there was these, those, those attacks. Nobody was harmed. There were some bomb threats. No bomb was found. No one was harmed. Um, and we still don't know who did that. Maybe it's the KGB, the, the Secret Service of Transnistria. Maybe it's the FSB, the Russian Secret Service. Maybe there were some Ukrainian nationalists uh, who wanted to solve the issue. We don't know that. Um, but there is this factor that Transnistria might join the war on the Russian side, and that would be a problem for Ukraine. But having said that, it's only 1,500 soldiers, Russian soldiers. If you add the Transnistrian soldiers, it's far, um, far more. But they are mostly equipped with old Soviet equipment. Um, so like the Ukrainians had been in, in 2014. And it's it's... Yeah, it's not clear what kind of military threat the Ukrainians would be, but because it's not solved, the the Ukrainians can't be sure, and that's why 
And there, there were always those uh, ideas where maybe we could take Transnistria in order to solve that so that this front is clear, if you want to call it like that. Is there any chance that either Transnistria or Moldova could play a positive role in the development of the war as brokers of some form of understanding, uh, especially like maybe Moldova, like the Minsk agreements, right? The Minsk Accords in 2014-15 were brokered by Belarus, which at that time behaved very neutrally and actually was trying to mend the the ties between Russia and Ukraine again. Is anything like that imaginable for for Moldova or is that would that be wishful thinking? Yeah, officially, Moldova is neutral. It's a member of CIS, of the Commonwealth of Independent States. It's the only CIS member not bordering any other CIS member because um, Ukraine left. Um, so it has those formal relations with the East and it's neutral, but also has this yeah, strong economic relations with Romania and with the West and also uh, some new military relations like the French president, he was um, there and donated a large amount of um, French military uh, goods to to Moldova. So it's 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 neutral and it could play a role. Maybe it's too small. I mean, the whole country has three and a half a million people. There's not a large diplomatic um, yeah, corps in Moldova. Also for the for the Russians, it's hard to reach because they can't go across. Um, you, the Ukrainian airspace, so they would have to go to Turkey and then via Romania to Moldova. So it's not ge geographically, it's it's not very easy. But through the good relations with East and West, and also with Transnistria, who also has good relations with East and West, it could be possible that the, they could use their neutrality in order to facilitate negotiations yeah, between the Russians and the Ukrainians. They are well versed to do that because because of the, the neutrality and their economic and um, yeah, political relations with east and west they would be it would be a, a good uh, a good thing but because of the geography I, I don't think that's realistic okay and maybe a last question so what's on the agenda in the political process in moldova and Transnistria in terms of elections are we are we expecting any kind of changes in 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 the current configuration how these two entities are being run yeah i just thought about transnistria i think the the current president is in an office pretty long i think there was, there should be a new election soon but the last election was uh, not very uh, transparent in Transnistria because on most um, districts only one party um, had a candidate, the the, the sheriff owned uh, renewal party, and uh, there were only Russian um, observers to that process. So that's um, politically not an easy situation in Transnistria. The government, the liberal government of Maya Sandu or associated with Maya Sandu, okay. they have many problems due to the um, energy problems or energy shortage and high prices and inflation and there are many demonstrations and there could be a um yeah a, a new election soon and those elections would be won according to current polls by the socialists and by the pro-russia leaning uh, opposition which w would be very difficult because they only border ukraine and not russia they only have access to the black sea via um, via the Danube or via Romania, and then you're talking be, about Moldova now. Uh, politically, very, very interesting. Yeah, Moldova. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Was so the Moldova. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, the Moldova. Moldova will have uh, um, elections uh, soon, and and the, the socialists or social democrats might might win, and and which are more uh, pro-Russian. That's what you're saying, right? No, they're not scheduled, but if there would be new elections, there would be a hard turn in, in foreign policy and the so socialists and also another party um, by uh, uh, Ilan Shor, who is kind of a right wing populist, but also pro a social state within Moldova. Um, they would gain power and then there would be a sharp turn in Moldovan politics, but they are not scheduled. The last elections were two years ago, I think. 
So the next elections would be in two or three years. So it's not very current, but the, the polls are very bad for the current government due to the situation because of the war and shortage of products, shortage of energy, high prices, inflation. Um, it's, it's a very difficult situation in, in Moldova. And there are large scale demonstrations against the government. And if there would be a new election, then would, that would mean uh, yeah, a change in, in foreign policy direction. And rather not towards more uh, EU integration, rather towards the other side. No, no, it would be towards the other side. Yeah, there was the the socialist president. Um, oh, I forgot his name. But there was a socialist president before Sandu, and he tried to to stop the EU integration process and also tried to start an integration process with the Eurasian Economic Union. But that was, uh, yeah, his government was uh, short lived and he did not have a large, or he mostly has a procedural role in Moldovan politics. So he did not have the influence to stop that. But if there would be new elections now in Moldova, that could mean that the EU integration is stopped, um, yeah, or halted, or um, there would be some very different um, foreign policy orientation. Okay, um, that was a, a lot of insight and, and overview of current Moldovan and Transnistrian um, politics. Um, David, I would like to thank you very much for your time and for your explanations and talk to you soon again.